We know the NSA has listened to our phone calls and spied on foreign leaders. But how did the NSA get so powerful in the first place? Welcome to the Henry A. Wallace National Security Forum. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. The disclosure of the NSA's programs of mass surveillance shocked the nation and gave bragging rights to legions of conspiracy theorists. Here to tell us how the NSA became the powerful agency that it is today is James Bamford. He's the author of The Shadow Factory, the ultra-secret NSA from 9-11 to the eavesdropping on America, and The Puzzle Palace, inside the National Security Agency, America's most secret intelligence organization. Welcome to the program, James. Thanks very much. Well, why don't we begin uh, at the origins of the National Security Agency? How did this agency begin and how has it been linked to the rise of what we now call the national security state? Well, the NSA began very differently from any other agency in the United States in the whole history of the country. Almost every other agency uh, in the United States, the CIA and every other agency, it uh, goes through a bill in Congress. NSA it was never created like that. It was created in absolute secrecy. It was created by Harry Truman signing a top secret seven page memorandum in 1952. So when it was created, even its name was top secret, and there were only a couple people, I think no more than two people in Congress, that were even allowed to know it existed. So it was born in absolute secrecy and has remained that way uh, most of its life. And so how did it come to be a, an organization that became acceptable to have in our political uh, landscape? Uh, how did it go from being a covert to a, an open uh, agency whose legitimacy we tend to take for granted now? Well, it, uh, it was gradual. It uh, was top secret when it was born. And then there was a major investigation of NSA in the mid-1970s by Senator Frank Church. It was called the Church Committee. And they found massive abuses by the NSA. And after that, the NSA was fairly uh, known to the public in terms of it, uh, its name appearing in the, in the press. And at that point, that's when the first attempts were made to bring some regulation to the NSA. And then how did the 9-11 attacks uh, prove to be a sort of turning point in uh, the NSA's scope and its jurisdiction? How did that moment in history become used by the NSA to vastly expand its powers? Well, after the Church Committee discovered that NSA had been illegally eavesdropping on Americans, it created a, uh, a mechanism to sort of protect the public from the NSA. It was called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. So from then on, anybody that uh, at NSA that wanted to eavesdrop on, on an American would have to get a warrant from the secret court, the FISA court, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. And that worked fairly well. The problem was after 9-11, the Bush administration didn't trust the FISA court. And so it decided to bypass it. And that's uh, against the law. The, the law, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act says that any time an American is targeted by NSA, they must go through the FISA court. So the Bush administration after 9-11 bypassed that law and began eavesdropping on a massive scale on Americans in the United States. So given that the NSA's uh, scope has expanded and of course uh, funding has expanded in these years since 9-11, I think we should ask that question. It has been tasked with protecting us from another terrorist attack. Has it succeeded in this role that it has been given? Just to give you a track record, uh, before 9-11, NSA missed the first World Trade Center attack. It missed the uh, attack on the USS Cole. Uh, it missed the attacks on the US embassies in East Africa. And it missed 9-11. NSA watched 9-11 take place in total surprise on the television set. Uh, and then after 9-11, it missed the underwear bomber, and then it missed the Times Square bomber, and it missed the uh, marathon bombers up in Boston. So even with all this extra eavesdropping, it still keeps missing everything. So no, I don't think it's been successful. There are a number of ways that NSA could really, I think, help uh, in, in the terrorism uh, fight against terrorism, but the way they're going about it by eavesdropping on everybody all the time is not the way to do it. Now, the 
chill, the chilling effect that we have today with an organization like the NSA can be quite devastating. Tell us about the so-called national security letters. What are they? What does one do when one receives one? What can one do? Well, normally if, uh, if the government, if the FBI wants uh, to get access to some records that you have, your phone records or whatever, uh, it would have to get a subpoena from a judge. It would have to tell a judge that, look, there's a probable cause this person's involved in a crime. Well, what the national security letters do is it bypasses that uh, safeguard. It orders that person to turn those records over, and then it orders that person never to say anything about the fact that they did turn those records over. So it's this very secret, or, uh, very secret uh, uh, order that basically bypasses any safeguards, uh, the safeguards being a, a third branch of government, the, uh, uh, the judiciary system where a judge can rule whether it's legal or not. Now, these days, with some of the revelations that we've gotten about what the National Security Agency is actually doing, we know of a program known by its mysterious acronym PRISM. Can you tell us what PRISM is and how it might be impacting all our daily lives without us even realizing? What PRISM is, is, uh, is it's a secret cooperation between the major internet companies like Yahoo and Google. And what uh, PRISM is, is, a, is the program that NSA will go into what's called the front door of, say, Google, and say, we want all these records on James Bamford, or we want all these records on this group of people. And they have to turn them over, and they have to keep it secret, the fact that they're turning them over. So that's what's known as a front door approach. So given that they're collecting so much data, that there's this blanket surveillance, there are bound to be mistakes, aren't there? And what happens when somebody gets wrongly accused? What recourse do people have, for example, when they find themselves on watch lists, if they might have a name similar to somebody else's? What, what sort of power do ordinary citizens have over this enormous secretive operation? Well, the problem is a lot of the people won't ever know that they're on a watch list, on a secret watch list. Uh, the latest uh, numbers in terms of uh, watch lists, there were something approaching a million names on the watch list. The real problem here is that the people who don't know they're on it can really be affected by that uh, without their knowledge. For example, if they have a son or a daughter that wants to go to a service academy like West Point or Annapolis, they may make an application and uh, when that application comes in, the West Point, Annapolis, whoever gets the application may ask the intelligence community to look through its records, its uh, logs, to see if there's any uh, people on the watch list with this name. And if it turns up, then that person may not get accepted. Same thing if you're applying for a small business administration loan. There's all kinds of ways that you uh, can interact with the government, and the government can, can secretly uh, find your name on a watch list that may have your name on there accidentally and you may suffer because of it. What is the chilling I impact finally? What is the chilling impact that this program can have on journalism and also on political activism and per perhaps already has had? Well I think the, the uh, worst political impact is the fact that there is a uh, so much invasiveness that the agency can do. In other words if you're trying to contact a source or a source is trying to contact you to report illegality or, or, or something that's really wrong with the government, something that, that needs to be reported, they'd be inhibited from that because they know that the NSA has this blanket surveillance and no matter how they try to get in touch with you through an email or through a phone call, that because of this all-encompassing surveillance, they'll be discovered. So for a journalist, it really hurts in trying to expose wrongdoing in the government because people are inhibited. James Bamford, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. How many countries has the U.S. invaded? On the next episode of the Henry A. Wallace National Security Forum, award-winning journalist Stephen Kinzer takes us through the history of U.S. interventions. We think that we are really helping other countries by crashing into their affairs and trying to set them, as we would say, right. It's not up to the United States to sit in front of a map of the world and decide which countries are going right and which countries are going wrong and deserve American intervention.